Let me just say that. The second thing I need to say before we get started is, this is Athanasius, who is a theologian. This is not me. All right? I just wanted to be clear. This, he, is a, he is a theologian. He believed, he, he's actually one of the theologians that um, really pushed forward the idea of the Trinity, how each individual part of the Trinity, Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit, and the Father, are in fact one. And a lot of people would say they are um, three uh, persons uh, separate from their oneness, but they are one. And he was one of the theologians that really uh, drove home that point. So I just wanted to be clear, this is not me, all right? I don't know why I had to be clear about it, but I got so many questions this morning. Like, is that you? Like, why would I wear a t-shirt that has myself on it? I'm not that vain. So, thank you for joining us. Um, we are in part six. This is the last uh, message in our sermon series called This Is My Story. And this series has been phenomenal. It has been really good. So, if you missed any of this series, essentially from the beginning up until now, we talked about stories of people in the Bible and how we relate to them. So as we talked about their stories, there were always things that we can pull from their stories that we could also relate to. And I'll just go through uh, some of the stories that we did and then what we're doing today. So we started with David, the story of David. And David was, he was a problem. He had issues. He was a murderer. <clears throat> Excuse me, he committed adultery. We talked about the woman at the well who had relationship issues. She had um, five husbands, and she was living with one. And, you know, when you hear these things, a lot of times we don't relate this to the Bible, but if you've ever struggled with a relationship, you can relate to the woman at the well, whether you're a man or a female. You can relate to the woman at the well. Um, she just had real difficulty, but then she met Jesus, and her life was changed. Uh, we talked about the story of Abraham. Um, who lied multiple times. Um, God gave him a promise, and he tried to make that promise come to fruition. Uh, him and Sarah devised a, a master plan like Bonnie and Clyde. They were like, ha, 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 I know how to figure this out. And they didn't do it well. Um, and then we talked about Paul, who was uh, very angry. Uh, Paul had severe uh, anger issues, and he was ruthless. He was ruthless, and he terrorized people. But Jesus converted his life. Uh, we talked about Mary Magdalene last week with my wife. Uh, she was up here with me, Julia. And as we talked about Mary Magdalene's story, who had seven demons, and, and Jesus delivered her from those demons, um, it was, it was a, just a wonderful testimony, and my wife shared her story. Uh, and then today, we're going to talk about Peter and his life and what Jesus did in his life, and then at the end of this message, I'll also share my story. So you'll get stories from the Bible, but in this series, I wanted you to hear stories from us as well. And all of you have a story, and we want you to, to know what that story is and share that story because you sharing your story is going to help us. It's going to help somebody else. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to get started. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity to worship in the house of God today. I thank you for every family that is here represented in this building. I thank you for everyone who is watching us online. Father, I just pray that you would bless us all as we get into your word today. Father, speak to us, please, because we really do need to hear from you. Now, God, we love you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so today we're going to talk about the life of Peter. And again, this is the last series uh, the last message in this series. If you've missed weeks one through five, you can uh, check it out on our website, chapelfamily.org, or our YouTube channel. So today, week six, becoming who God intended. We're becoming who God intended uh, for us to be. And, and again, we're going to look at the life of Peter. But when you, when you look at a title that says becoming who God intended, 
for us to be. I believe that there are a lot of people who believe that they have a purpose. A lot of people believe uh, on the inside somewhere that there is something else for them to do, but they may not know how to get there. Or they, they may understand fully who they're supposed to be, but they are unwilling to go the path that they need to go to become who they need to become. Who knows what I'm talking about? Yeah. So it, it, it's like me when I'm on vacation. I, I love to go on vacation, but it's the traveling part. I just want to be there, and I want to be home, right? I don't want to catch the plane. I don't fly out of BWI or Philly. Well, I do if I have to, but I hate it. I would rather fly out of Harrisburg because when I come home, I don't want to go home. I want to be home. Does that make sense? Is it just me? All right. So in life, we have these destinations or these things that we feel or believe or know that God is uh, bringing us into, who we should become, who we want to become. For some of us, God has already preordained for you to become a a minister or or some sort of leader. Um, You may have a business and you feel that you're good at that, God gave you that talent, and this is the thing that you were really created to do. But then there are others who have a sense, but they don't know how to get there. God may have given you a vision or you have Um, in your heart, this idea that I'm supposed to do this, but I don't know how to get there. We're going to look at the life of Peter. Peter had no idea what he was going to become, how God was going to use him until he met Jesus. And for some of us, it's the same thing. Until we actually meet Jesus, until we come in contact with him, it's at that moment that our lives are changed forever. So I'm going to tell you a few things about Peter. Some some of you may already know some of the things that I'm going to tell you, but he was a fisherman. And he was minding his own business, fishing, and God got a hold of him, and Jesus got a hold of him, and we're going to read that. But fishermen usually in that day, they were strong, um, manly men pulling like large amounts of fish out of the water. They were vulgar. They had bad language. They were just um, just kind of earthy. They just, you know drank beer and and fished all day, you know? (laughs) That's what they did (laughs) back in that day. And he he was a fisherman. Not only that, he he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. So Jesus called him, and he became one of uh, his disciples, and we're going to get into the details of that story. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they actually have Peter, and they record Peter being the first disciple. And I think there is something to that. When you are the first to do something, it's interesting, and I believe it's done for a purpose. So when you read through those books, Peter was the first disciple. The other thing about Peter, he was in the inner circle. So there were times in Scripture where it wasn't all 12 disciples. It was just Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John having a conversation with Jesus or at the transfiguration. Uh, when Jesus, um, he, his body transformed into his heavenly body, and they, like, they were there to witness that. Um, Peter also wrote two books, first and second, who knows the names? First and second, Peter. He wrote two books um, of the New Testament. Now, he had issues that he had to work through. Peter had a lot of issues that he needed to work through, and I'm sure that we can all relate to Peter and his issues and the things that he had to work through. So let's start with the initial calling when he met Jesus. So we're going to go to Luke chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Uh, If you're watching online, we'll put it up on the screen so you can read along with us. So Luke 5 verse 4, it says this, when he had finished speaking, I'm reading from the NLT, New Living Translation. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. So this is uh, what happened in the story prior. Jesus, this was after his temptation in Luke chapter 4, after he began preaching. Um, He was preaching uh, right outside the shore of Galilee. He borrowed Peter's boat. He just walked up to Peter and said, let me use your boat. He got on Peter's boat, and then he started preaching from Peter's boat to a large crowd, and the crowd was listening 
to him preach. And this is where we're picking up this story. So that's why it says, when he had finished speaking, because he was speaking to the crowd, he said to Simon, who is Peter, now go where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. When I read that statement, I really believe that that statement, let's go where it is deeper, let down your nets to catch some fish, that statement encapsulates Peter's life. Peter is here, living his life to the best of his ability, to the best of his knowledge. He's doing everything that he knows how to do. But when he meets Jesus, Jesus says, let's go, me and you, deeper than where you are. We're going somewhere else, somewhere that you have never been before. And Jesus is taking him to a place that he had never been before. Why is Jesus doing this? So that Peter could do something that he had never done before. He wanted him to get results that he hadn't gotten. So Jesus says, this is what we're going to do. Go out deeper, and we're going to catch some fish. That's what he says to him. So let's go to the next verse. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. So this is Peter's response to Jesus. Master, been there, done that, got the t-shirt, didn't work. That's his response to Jesus. Master, we worked all, all last night and we didn't catch anything. So I just want to stop there just for a second because I think something uh, stands out to me. Working hard and, and being effective are different. There, there's a difference between working hard and actually being effective in what you're going to do or what you are doing. So what Peter had on his resume was, I worked hard. What Jesus was saying is, but you're not effective. Peter is saying, I worked really hard. I did what I was supposed to do all last night. And sometimes we can pat ourselves on the back for the hard work that we put in. And we're working really hard and we're super busy and our calendar is booked and we're flying down the street to get to church on time because we were really, really busy and doing something else and we speed to work on Monday mornings because, you know, we, 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 we got things to do. We got to get the kids out of the house and we got to, you know, make sure we send out emails and we got to make sure that the babysitter's okay and we got to put the groceries away or whatever you have to do. But sometimes we live our lives working hard but are ineffective. So Jesus approached Peter, and you know what he said to him, go out deeper. So listen, this is, what, this is what I believe the Holy Spirit was showing me from this verse. Obedience is better than effort. Being obedient is better than the effort that we put forward. And sometimes we put forth so much effort, but we are not following directions. We can put forth so much effort. Imagine putting together a bike and, and you got the right screwdriver, you got the Phillips and you got a flat and, and you got a wrench and, and you have all the pieces to the bike and you're using the wrench and you're, you're putting it on the bolt and you're using the screw and you're screwing this into the, to the wheel and you're doing all the right things and you're working hard. And imagine even if you started sweating, just like, whew, I'm crushing it, I'm killing it, I'm putting together this bike, I've been doing it all night long. But you never read the instructions. So you're working really, really hard, but you're not following directions. And I believe this speaks directly to some of the patterns that we see in our own lives. And I know I see this in my life. You know, you work diligently, and it seems like you are putting in so much work and you're making things happen, 
But are you following directions? Are you, are you following the voice of God? Are you reading the scriptures? Are you wondering why relationships may not be working in your favor? Are you trying to muscle your way into someone's life or into someone's mind or trying to change someone's mind about something? You're trying to force your way into their life, but you're really not following directions. God has given us directions in terms of relationships, and if we are obedient to what he has said, it's much better than human effort. It's much better than human effort. So in order for us to really become who God intended, Peter has to follow directions and go out deeper than where he is. Got to go out deeper than where you are. I got to go out deeper than where I am. <clears throat> if I really want to see God do something different, got to go out deeper. So let's go back to the text. So Jesus, <coughs> we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets again. And this time, their nets were so full of fish, they began to tear. What was the difference? He followed directions. He followed what Jesus said. He actually obeyed God's word. And when he obeyed God's word, he got different results. He got different results. It's, it's that simple. He did it on his own, in his own effort, and he got nothing. But when he partnered his life with Jesus, and Jesus said, come on, we're going to go out deeper than where you were before. We're going to go to some place that you didn't go. He got different results. Somebody say amen. So let's go to verse 7. A shout for help brought their partners in the other boat. And soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. So now you see some of Peter's personality coming out. It just wasn't, thank you so much. I can't believe that, like, that this happened. I did this all night. He said, leave, go. I'm sinful. I don't deserve this. Go away, and you see part of Peter's personality come out. He's telling, first he called a master, now he's telling the master what to do. Y'all see that? So let's go to verse 9. For he was awestruck by the number of fish they had caught. Peter's mind was blown at what Jesus did in just a few minutes of meeting him. He followed his instruction. And Jesus took him to a place that he had never been before to accomplish something he had never accomplished before. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. What is Jesus doing? He is now pointing Peter to who he had always intended for him to be. He's now pointing Peter. He met Jesus. And when he met Jesus, Jesus gave him a glimpse of what life would be like if he surrendered to him, if he would listen to his instruction, if he would follow his lead. Just in that one instance when he said, we're going out deeper to catch some fish. After Peter got a small taste of that, Jesus now revealed to him, this is your true purpose. You are going to now be fishing for people. Now, as soon as they landed, as soon as the, the, the boat came back to shore with all the fish, they left everything and followed Jesus. They left everything everything and follow Jesus and I believe this is in the scriptures for a reason because we need to be reminded that following him will cost us everything following him will cost us 
everything. And sometimes we want to hold on to things. We want to hold on to things of our past, things we've become emotionally attached to or, or things that on the low we really, really love and we just, we just don't want to let go of them. We don't want to let go of them. So we want to hold on. It could be bad behavior. It could be, you know, something else. But we have this desire to hold on to things. Francis Chan says something that was really good. And I'm going to read this quote. It, it's, it's, it's powerful. He said, you find that the things you let go of while following Jesus were the things that were going to destroy you in the end. I'm going to read it again. Just, just take it in. You find that the things you let go of while following Jesus were the things that were going to destroy you in the end. Sometimes we don't realize in the moment <clears throat> we want to have these things in our lives because they bring us comfort. They make us feel good. You know, they're familiar. So we, we're unwilling to get rid of old friends or, old, you know, old relationships and things like that, even old patterns. We don't want to get rid of it because we find comfort, but we don't realize that in the end, it ultimately can destroy us. So, although Peter was called by Jesus, and we read that Peter was pointed by Jesus to who God intended for him to be, there were some things that Peter needed to work out, and we're going to talk about them. The first thing that Peter really needed to work out were his doubts. Peter had doubts. There are three instances that we're going to look at today. There are more, but there are three that we're going to look at uh, for today. Peter's doubt. So let's go to Matthew 14, 30, and verse 31. And it says this. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, this is when uh, Jesus told the disciples to get into the boat, go across the sea, um, and then uh, there was a storm, and then Jesus started walking on the water towards the boat where the disciples were. So, but when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord. Now, this was Peter. So, Jesus... Peter saw Jesus coming. First, the disciples thought it was a ghost. Then Peter said, not the other disciples, it's Peter, the beer-drinking fisherman. <laughs> Peter said, if that's you, tell me to come. So Jesus said, come. Peter gets out of the boat, and he begins to walk on the water. But the scripture tells us Peter saw something different. He saw the strong wind and the waves and was terrified and began to sink. So there was a moment in time where his faith was so strong that he felt like he could walk on water. Then moments later, he started looking at the waves and the wind and the external circumstances, the things that were happening externally. And when he started to look at those things, that's when he began to sink. I can relate to that. I can relate to that. Feeling confident, like I can accomplish something for the Lord and, and I step out on faith and I begin to do it. And then all of a sudden, Noise starts coming. Someone, someone drops a comment on a post that I thought was a masterpiece on social media. And they were like, that's trash. And I'm like, man, I worked really hard on that. Or, you know, sometimes we take these pictures. We take 34 pictures to get the right picture. on social media. But the crazy thing is, even when you get the right picture after taking 34 pictures, you use another 10 minutes to add filters to it. Like if that was the right picture, then let it be the right picture. 
Side, side note. But anyway, external things come along and they begin to cause us to be fearful. What happens is they cause us to doubt. Causes us to doubt. And there could be things that happen externally that cause you to doubt your faith. Is God able? Will God do this? I, I, I know that he has the ability to do it, but will he do it for me? You start looking at external situations or things that are happening in the news, and you get fearful. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You can, you can come to a place where you start to doubt. You know, they, I don't know if God's going to save my children. I don't know if my marriage will ever get any better. We've been doing this for a long time. Well, what needs to happen is you need to go with Jesus out deeper. If you go out deeper, you'll have different results. So now Peter, he's walking on the water. He looks at the external situations. He begins to sink. Now, Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. Imagine Jesus saying this to you, like, in person. Not in the Bible, like, in person. You have so little faith. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? Jesus is asking him. So Peter, even though called by Jesus to eventually become someone who is fishing for men, someone who is reaching out into the community to make a difference, someone who has the, the innate ability on the inside of him to really be a blessing to other people and encourage them and lead them to the gospel. Peter has a call on his life. Even him, he felt like he let God down in this instance. He felt doubt. He did. And Jesus asked the question, why did you doubt me? Let's look at the next thing in Peter's life. The next thing we want to look at is Peter's temper. So Peter had doubts, but Peter also had a temper. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands if you have temper issues. Because then I'll have to suffer the consequences after church. Why would you have me raise my Matthew 26, Jesus said, oh, let me, let me tell you what's happening in this story. So this is after um, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples. Soldiers come to arrest him. That's what's happening. Soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus, um, and this is before he goes on trial. Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus, kisses him on the cheek to identify this is the one that you want to get. This is, this is the one that you want to take out. So Judas just kissed Jesus on the cheek, and now we pick up the story here. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. Then the others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men Jesus pulled, with Jesus pulled out his sword. Guess who that was? It was Peter. One of the men, and the, others, and the other gospels tell you who it was, one of the men with Jesus pulled out his sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing his ear off. So Peter had a temper. He had some anger issues. Peter was raw. There are people in here who are raw. And again, I'm not going to identify you. Um, there are people in here who are raw. You know, yeah, yeah, that's just where we are, right? And that's okay. Peter, Peter was still with Jesus, but he did pull out his sword that he had handy and was prepared to use it. And scripture doesn't say, Peter was like, man, what should I do? Nah, I ain't going to get involved. No, Peter pulled out his sword and went, and a lot of people think he like cut his ear off. Like, it wasn't beautiful. It wasn't pretty. It was probably like very Matrix-like, like Peter swung for his head. So the guy was like, doo, 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 doo. And, then, and then Peter got his ear. Like that's how it happened. 
Like it wasn't, it wasn't like Peter was like, no, Peter was trying to cut his head off. The guy leans back and then Peter just got his hair. So the guy was probably happy he didn't get his head. He only got his hair, but that's what happened. Peter was ready with his sword. How many of you have your swords in your pocket waiting for the right moment for somebody to say the wrong thing? And when they say the wrong thing, you can pull that thing out quick. And you go for the head. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it can, it, it's us. This is our story. This is our story. You know who this is? This is half of us on Monday morning. Right? There's half of us on Monday morning. We are very saved right now. But on Monday morning, it's different. You fight in traffic. You, you get what I'm saying? Like your coffee machine's not working. Your husband used all the creamer and didn't tell you. Well, why don't you get some more creamer? Well, I thought you knew we didn't have creamer. Well, if I knew, I would have got creamer. That's what you should have did. And all of this is happening on Monday morning. You're trying to figure out what you're doing with the kids and all of this stuff goes on. You get to work and your boss says you're five minutes late. You're like, I know. I got a clock. I got a watch. I got a phone. <laughs> so all of these things happen. We pull out our sword and we use it. And we're not afraid to use it. Well, Jesus had to help Peter. It's like, I appreciate your efforts, son. But this is a different kingdom. And we do things differently here. We don't cut off people's ears that I came to die for. But it's the same for us. Sometimes we pull out our sword and we don't even realize that Jesus died for them too. He came to help them too. He's not just your personal Jesus. Right? That he just came to save you and the people that you like. <laughs> and he don't save other people, just the people that you prefer. No, that's not how it goes. So, even though he had a temper, he pulled out this sword and he started swinging on people. It didn't change his calling. There was still in Peter what God was making, uh, what God intended for him to be, who God intended for him to become. It didn't nullify it, but Peter had some things to work on. He just had some things to work on, and Jesus was with him. The third thing we're talking about is Peter's denial. So, Jesus got arrested. He was headed to the trial. And Jesus already told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter was like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. You're going to deny me three times. And he was like, I'd never do that, Jesus. Okay? So, that's what happened. I don't know why Peter after three years, thought Jesus was all of a sudden going to be wrong. He had been right about everything else up to this point. So, the text tells us in Matthew 26, it says, meanwhile, and I put the wrong verse up there. It's not, um, oh, yes, it is. Yeah, sorry. It says, meanwhile, Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came over and said to him, you were one of those with Jesus, the Galilean. But Peter denied it in front of everyone. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And that was the first denial. Now he does it two more times. He denies, I don't know who Jesus is, two more times. Then when you go down to verse 75, after the third denial, suddenly... Jesus' words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times that you even know me. And he went away weeping bitterly. So now, the one who came to save him, the one who gave him hope, Peter denied him. 
three times when, when, you know, he knew he had a calling on his life to become what God wanted him to become. He messed up again. And a lot of times we find ourselves in that situation where we mess up multiple times. Now, our stories can reflect Peter's story. But the good thing is this is not the end of Peter's story. Just like it's not the end of your story. You may be in a certain place in your story and you feel like it's the end. It's not the end. If you are still breathing and God still has you here, then God still has you here for a purpose. There is something that God wants to do in your life and in your heart. So I want to encourage you. You see the call on Peter's life, and he did some things that that didn't line up with the will of God in that moment, but it did not disqualify him. So even for you, you may do things that don't line up with the will of God, and you may feel like it disqualifies you from being a son, or it disqualifies you from being a daughter of Jesus. It does not. God still has a purpose and a hand on your life to complete what he has called you to complete. Amen? All right, so now, this was not the end of Peter's story. There was still a promise that God gave him. So we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, but before we go there, something happened. So uh, Jesus was resurrected, promise of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, they were waiting for the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to come down. And when the Holy Spirit came down, they began to speak in other tongues. Um, they began to speak in other languages, and other people from other countries heard them speaking in their languages. That's what Scripture says. And then Peter uh, began to preach to this large, large crowd. And we can see as he was preaching to this crowd what happened. So we're going to jump in the middle of his sermon while he was preaching to this large crowd. Uh, Acts 2, verse 38. Now, Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. This is Peter's message in this crowd. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So he is preaching these things to Gentiles, people who did not know the, uh, the Lord, and he is telling them what they need to do. Verse 40 says this, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the, by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time. So this was not just the first sermon, it was the first long one. Strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now, verse 41 says, those who believe what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000. About 3,000 people. You know what just happened? Peter began fishing for men. This was over three years later. Now, Peter, he doubted Jesus. He had temper issues, anger issues. He denied that he was even associated with Jesus after he did, after Jesus did everything for him. He showed him and imparted into him everything that he had to give Peter. Peter still denied him. Peter messed up multiple times, but it did not stop the will of God from coming to pass. You don't have the ability to stop the will of God from coming to pass. If God wants to do something in your heart and in your life, what you do to mess it up is not enough. Scripture tells us where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. That means there is grace available to you, even if you mess up, even if you do something you're not supposed to do, even if you royally screw up things, relationships, you call it. If you do something that you're not supposed to do, it does not disqualify you from doing what God has preordained for you to do. 
It doesn't disqualify you. God still wants to use, and we see this in the life of Peter. God called him. He changed his life. Peter messed up. Jesus kept, imagine the patience that Jesus had with Peter. The patience that he had with him. Peter even confronted him one time, and Jesus was like, we ain't doing this today. Get behind me, Satan. Like, we, this, ain't, this, this is not about to happen. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus, Peter even confronted him. But at the end of the day, what happened early in Scripture, when Jesus said, I am going to make you a fisher of people, came to fruition in Acts chapter 2, when Peter finally brought himself to maturity, through the difficulty, through the challenges. Sometimes we don't like the challenges, but we got to go through the challenges because the challenges will produce maturity. If you don't go through the problems, you won't get to the promise. We got to go through the hard stuff. The hard stuff gives you the character to sustain the promise. So oftentimes we have this idea, we just want this promise. We just want this to come to pass and come to fruition. But if you don't, if you only have the talent and you don't have the character, your talent can take you there, but your lack of character will dismiss you early. It will send you on your way. Yeah, talent will get you there. Character keeps you there. It keeps you there. So three years later, Peter finally gets to this point where he fulfills the call of life, the call on his life. And it will take you some time as well. And I can speak directly to that. And, you know, my story is not dissimilar from everybody's story that we talked about in this whole series. Because I did what Peter did, I did what Paul did, I did what, uh, all, um, you know, Mary Magdalene, all of them. That was part of my story, and, and, and God did a miraculous work. So I grew up in a healthy family here. My mom and dad are here. And so I grew up in a two-parent household. Um, like a lot of people, they grew up in a two-parent household. Um, but what happened early on, for me, and I believe I was probably in middle school, um, I came across some magazines that were Playboy, Penthouse, whatever, in school. And they, you know, I don't know if anyone else went to middle school, but, you know, they, they'll pass this stuff around. And I was exposed to it. So upon being exposed to it, the first time I was like, what, ill? what is this? What are you showing me? But that doesn't mean at that moment that the enemy didn't plant something in here and in here. And sometimes you can't unsee things that you saw. So eventually, that was something that I began to seek out. So I struggled with pornography. Struggled. And to the point where it began to affect how I thought. We already live in a sexualized culture. I am not telling any secrets. Right? You guys know we live in a sexualized culture. And what happens in our sexualized culture, it is thrown at us. They say for every TV show, there are at least um, nine, um, what do they say, like um, 900 sexual references within a TV show, just one show, between jokes, innuendos, um, things that you visually see. And for me, that became something that grew on the inside. It was like, okay, this is a monster that I kept feeding and it began to grow. So I struggled for years and years watching pornography. And it was something that gripped me. 
It was something that gripped me to the point where it was driving my behavior. It was driving my behavior. It would drive me to do things that I didn't necessarily want to do, but because my mind had absorbed and consumed so much of that information, what happened was I was rewiring the way that I thought to think that that was normal, that that was normal behavior, that that was normal um, whatever, is normal way of living. And I finally got to the point after, you know, years of just um, indulging and, and just being, you know, immersed in that, that God got a hold of me. Now, I always knew that it was wrong, but I struggled back and forth. I'm just like, you know, I want to be free, but I don't know how to be free. I was like, I want to be free, but I don't know how to get free from this. Because it's not, and you'll know what I'm talking about, it's not like I was struggling with alcoholism. So the only thing I had to do was not go to a place that served alcohol. Right? It was accessible now. I mean, we're talking about the 90s when the internet came out. I didn't have to go to find some weird place like they did in the 70s and, and just in some back alley and go to a store to have all these things on it. I have to do that. It was, so that was a struggle. Then God got a hold of me, though. Very much like Peter. It wasn't when I met Jesus. It was a series of, I'm going to follow you. Then I do something real stupid. I'm going to follow you, Jesus. Then I would pull out my sword. I'm going to follow you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to commit to you. Then I would slip up and I would watch something else again. And over time, the Lord continued to work with me. So I, I, I put in the work, too. I don't want you to think that I just prayed and, and just like, Jesus, take it away. And he took it away. No, it, I had to put in work. I had to put in work. So I, I, I went to a ministry, and I was just like, give me everything that you have. And I learned a lot, um, read a lot of books. I, I, spent, I, I worked on my prayer life because at the end of the day, the idol in my life was sexual idolatry. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Lord God. So I had to learn the difference that Jesus really actually needs to be the Lord of my life which means he needs to be the Lord of my thoughts, right? He, he needed to be the Lord of my thought life. <clears throat> and God began to transform me in that way. And I've shared this before where there was a pastor that I met with over the years and he challenged me and I said, Pastor, I'm struggling. I'm struggling with pornography and I need help. He said, this is what you're going to do. And I would meet with him every week. He said, I want you to memorize Romans chapter 6. And I said, you mean verse what? He said, no, I want you to memorize Romans chapter 6. And then he said to me, he said, your struggle is in your mind. And because your struggle is in your mind, now you have to take in large doses of the word of God. And if you take in large doses of the word of God, just like medicine, God's word will begin to work in your mind and in your heart. So I did it. Every week, I would carry a piece of paper in my pocket. And I would write down verses 1. Uh, I started with like verses 1 through 4. And at that time, I, it was the King James Version. I had it. And I would say, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. And I would say it over and over and over, obsessively over and over because what I found out was I knew how to worship. I was worshiping the wrong thing. 
So in the same way, I would meditate on these images that I would see pornographically. I would meditate on these over and over in my mind. The strategy now was, no, meditate on my word day and night, just like scripture says, and then you will be like a tree planted by the river of water, which brings forth fruit in a season. So I was insane with it. In my pocket, I had these notes and I would just write it out and I would go meet with him. And I said, I'm up to verse 14. And I would walk like go for walks or go for runs and I would just say what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein know ye not that so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ we're baptized into his death therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death and I would say it over and over. I would lay in my bed. I would say it over and over. I would wake up. I would say it over and over and over and over again because I knew the battle that I had to win was in here. That's where the battle was. So then I did it. I had all the verses. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. That's the last verse in that chapter. Finally, I did all of the verses and I had it. So you know what I did when I was tempted to think about something that was ungodly? I would just start, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? I used to get like I was an actor now. I'm like, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. How shall we who have been baptized? I mean, and I would just say it over and over and over until it became internalized and a part of me and God's word began to work on the inside of me. And what used to have uncontested control over my life, God broke it off of. He broke it off of me. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful. One of the unfortunate things is we live in a generation now that doesn't even see that as sin. They see it as normal. They see it as normal. It's just that's just, that's what we do. It's just what we do. And the enemy is really affecting families. It affected, it affected my family. But I'm standing here today to tell you that God is so good. He is so faithful. And the reason the stories matter is because if you don't share your story, it does, sharing your story does two things. Number one, it reinforces the freedom that God has given you. And every time I say it again, I'm reminded I'm free. God did this. <clears throat> the other thing it does is it helps somebody else. I don't question for one minute that there are people in this room who struggle with pornography. I'm not questioning that. What I'm bringing, and I believe this is what the Holy Spirit is doing, he brought this up because it's time for you to be free. It's time for you to be free. Let's stand to our feet. I'm going to um, have you bow your heads, and we're, we're, we're almost done. We're going to leave here soon. This was um, a little longer today just because it was the last part of the series, and I wanted to share my story as well. But I believe God was speaking 
to some of you. And I'm going to pray for you. So let's bow our heads, close our eyes. This is one of those moments where we want, um, we want God to really have his way. There are people who are in, in different stages of life. You're dealing with different things, and it's challenging, and I get it. But your life may look like Peter's life, and you maybe feel like, you know, you don't have a call, you don't have a purpose. Your story may mirror Peter's story. Your story may mirror my story. It doesn't matter because God can change you, your life, and your story. And that's what I believe today, and that's what we're going to pray today. So as we close out, we're going to do something different. And, and just, again, keep your eyes closed. But if anything that I said today affected you and you're just like, God was speaking directly to me, with your eyes closed, I don't want anyone to feel pressure, but just raise your hand because I'm going to pray for you. Raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. All right, Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. And we thank you for giving us life, health, strength. We thank you for your word that changes us. It literally changes us. And God, I pray right now for those who slip their hands in the air because you spoke to them. And God, I pray that you would provide everything that they need. They may need freedom right now from things that are shameful and they don't even want to speak about it. They may need freedom right now from from even things that I talked about. They may be struggling with sexual sin in some sort of capacity. And it's controlling their minds. It's seeped into their hearts. And they really need freedom. Father, I pray right now that you would meet them where they are in the name of Jesus and provide them with exactly what they need. Lord, you know every one of our stories and you know where we are. And Father, I believe you have a desire to save, heal, deliver, and set free. So God, I pray that you would do just that right now in the name of Jesus. God, we know that you are able. We know that you are willing and we know that you are able. Now, while your eyes are still closed, there may be someone who doesn't know the Lord and they want to give their heart to the Lord. Maybe someone who walked away from the Lord and they want to repent of their sins and begin to follow Jesus. They may, you may be watching online, this may describe you, or you may be here with us, and this may describe you. Either way, collectively as a body of believers, before the, the cross and before the foot of Jesus, I want us to pray together collectively. So I want you to repeat after me, and if this is sincerely the desire of your heart, let the Lord know this is, this is sincerely the desire of your heart. So let's pray together. Say, Father, in Jesus' name. I ask for forgiveness, and I ask that you would change my life. I have sinned before you, and you're the only one who can save me and change me. Please come into my heart and be the king of my heart. I believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and died on the cross for my salvation. And I believe that when he died, my sins were canceled. And I want you to be the Lord of my life, Jesus. Right now, my life belongs to you. And I believe by faith 
that I am yours. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to let us know. If you're watching online, send us an email. Uh, if you prayed that prayer for the first time here today, let me know. Uh, I, I want to give you some information and help you in your journey. Uh, we're just going to sing just the chorus of one song before we go. And while your eyes are closed, if you want to just raise your hands to the Lord while we sing. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free in me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. No, in my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Sing it again. Whom the sun, whom the sun, oh, it's child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. In my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So, Father, as we prepare to leave this place with not your presence, I pray that you would be with us, protect us, continue to speak to us as we walk out of this building, continue to deal with us, continue to transform our lives to be in the image of Jesus Christ. God, we want to become who you've called us to become, and I believe that you are working in our story today. We give you praise in the name of Jesus. Let everybody say it loud. Amen.